Dear clients and customers of Kräutermix, I'm happy that Kräutermix asked me to do a second part of the online workshop about phytotherapy. So our today's topic is phytotherapy for digestive problems in dogs and horses. And I'm very happy to speak to you about this today. I'd like to shortly introduce myself. My name is Katja Gertz. I'm a veterinarian. Since 2009, I run my practice for holistic veterinary medicine, and I'm specialized in manual therapies like chiropractic and osteopathy, and also in traditional Chinese veterinary medicine and acupuncture. And with Kräutermix, I share the passion for plants, so I'm very interested, especially in medicinal herbs. I will switch off the camera now, and I hope you enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Today we will talk about five plants. First, I'd like to give you an update on turmeric and frankincense, which we already dealt with in the first workshop. But I will add the information for the gastrointestinal part and give a short overview over the um, general part. And the three new plants we're talking about are licorice, yarrow and marshmallow. And we will talk about origin and pharmacology, scientific evidence, and their indications and dosages. Before starting about our original topic, I would like to emphasize that before initiating any herbal treatment, every pet should be carefully assessed and diagnosed. And this should be ideally be done by a veterinary practitioner who is certified in phytotherapy. We already discussed turmeric in our first workshop, so this is kind of an update. And um, just a little reminder that the dark, intense, orange-yellow color is a sign for a good quality of curcuma. You might as well already know this slide from the last workshop. So just a quick repetition, we talked about the areas of the world where turmeric is cultivated and about its main constituents, which were curcuminoids and volatile oils, and about its clinical actions, with our, which are described as anti-inflammatory, antioxidant and antiplatelet. Just a quick reminder of the effects that were obtained from cell culture testing laboratory animal and human studies for turmeric. We know that it has a low bioavailability due to its lipophilic nature. So we, in humans, we can combine it with black pepper because that reduces the metabolism in the liver. So it has a um, higher area under the curve. Um, that is not really doable in animals, but in animals we could add some high quality fat to the food that makes the turmeric um, better to resorb for the gut cells or use a preparation where it's um, in a micelle or a phytosome. So include it into a little drop of fat. Um, we know that Turmeric accumulates in gastrointestinal cells, and of course that is very interesting for the treatment of gastrointestinal disorders, and for that reason it is said to be effective in colon disease in human beings. Gastrointestinal effects that were obtained from a small number of human studies and animal models showed that Turmeric increased the bowel motility and also reduced the time that the ingester stayed in the small intestine. It also showed increase of carbohydrate fermentation in the large intestine. An improvement of activity of digestive enzymes, especially the pancreatic ones, was observed. Also a reduction of 
enzyme-induced gastrointestinal ulcers and an increase of mucus produced by the intestinal goblet cells, and histamine receptor mediated inhibition of gastric acid secretion was observed and in mice and rats turmeric reduced injury related to inflammatory colitis there was a study in dogs in with chronic periodontitis and that was also reduced by the use of turmeric and it showed cholagogue, hepatoprotective, and cholesterol-lowering activity. Turmeric can be used solely or in combination. Traditional usage in human beings is for peptic ulcer, for rheumatoid arthritis, for any kind of pain, as an anti-inflammatory and tonic substance, and many other indications. Ethno veterinary usage includes external application, for example, for wounds, gastrointestinal and respiratory disorders, rheumatism, and colic. Contraindications and side effects obstruction of the biliary tract is a contraindication. We already said that turmeric is cholagogue, so, increase of the bile flow might lead to colic. If the patient is already suffering from an obstruction of the biliary tract, caution is also in place if the patient already had, has herbs or other medication that is antiplatelet or anticoagulation, um, because turmeric also has an influence on the anticoagulative system. And one has to be careful if there is any known sensitivity, for example, to ginger, as ginger and turmeric um, both belong to kind of the same family and um, both can lead to allergic skin reactions. As there are none or only very few studies for the pharmacology of herbs in domestic animals. All the dosages I'm discussing in this workshop are usually um, empiric. So dosages for turmeric according to the literature depend on the curcumin content and the preparation of the drug. For dogs the suggested dosage for curcumin would be 50 to 250 milligrams per kilograms divided three times daily. 50 to 600 milligrams per kilogram per day, also optimally divided three times. And for the phytosome formulation, it would be four milligrams per kilograms twice a day. For horses, accordingly, the curcumin dosage is 1200 to 1400 milligrams per day, five to 10 grams of the dried herb per day and 4 milligrams per kilogram body weight of the phytosome formulation twice a day. Like turmeric, we discussed frankincense in the first part of the workshop already. So here comes the update for the gastrointestinal effects of frankincense. Just a reminder, when we're talking about frankincense for medicinal purposes, we're usually referring to the Indian frankincense, which is Boswellia serrata. And the part of the plant we're using is its resin. Its biological activities are mostly attributed to its essential oils and non-volatile D and triterpenes and the clinical actions that are important for gastrointestinal disorders are its analgesic action, its immune modulating action, actually it's sometimes even suppressant, immune suppressant, and its antidiarrheal, antibacterial and antifungal qualities.
frankincense specifically inhibits 5 lipooxygenase and therefore reduces the production of leukotrienes which contribute to certain inflammatory processes in the body. The gastrointestinal effects observed in human studies and animal models for frankincense showed that it stabilizes the intestinal barrier by sealing the tight junctions, inhibits intestinal motility without impairing transit of the ingester, showed an anti-inflammatory response that was comparable to those that of dexamethasone, ameliorated oxidative stress that was associated with intestinal inflammation in laboratory animals. 36% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease reported positive therapeutic effects on their intestinal condition and a lecithin based delivery form of Beswellia attenuated symptoms that were associated with mild ulcerative colitis including intestinal pain, diarrhea episodes and cramps. Frankincense can be used either solely or in combination and its main indication in the area of gastrointestinal diseases are chronic inflammatory gut diseases. Frankincense is quite safe, but with noticeable acute GI problems, as it's a raisin, resin, it's not so easy to digest. So when you once tried, or maybe you tried um, frankincense capsules or something like that, then you recognize that your stomach might get upset with it. And it's the same with the animals because it's so hard to digest. So when you have acute gastrointestinal upset or stomach upset, it might not be the very best choice. And with the one um, side effect that has been reported are allergic skin reactions with itching and um, eczema in the skin. The dosage of frankincense depends tremendously on the boswellic acid content and preparation. So for dogs, we would use the dried herb or crude drug in a dosage of 25 to 4, 500 milligrams per kilogram daily, optimally divided into three single portions. And in equine patients, there is no scientifically proven dosage um, and suggested is to use the dried herb with 3,200 to 4,000 milligrams per day if the boswellic acid content is 80% in the crude drug. So the first, so to say, new herb we're talking about today is licorice or in Latin Glycerisa glabra. There are other subspecies as well, but the one that is mostly used medicinally is Glycerisa glabra. And of course, everybody knows it from sweets. But um, in, for medicinal purposes, uh, we are using the shredded or powdered root of the plant. And in the next slides, we will talk about how the actions are and what it can do for us. So licorice belongs to the family of Fabaceae or Leguminosae. It's a perennial herb native to the Mediterranean, southern and central Russia and Asia, minor to Iran. There are various species of licorice now cultivated throughout Europe, Asia and the Middle East. And the part that is applicable is the root. The main active constituent is glycerizin and its clinical actions are anti-inflammatory, 
Antiphlogistic, Adaptogen, Antispasmodic, Laxative, Taste Improving, Antiulcerogenic and Hepatoprotective. Adaptogenic is a term coming from holistic medicine, meaning it helps the body to adapt to stress and other noxious or toxins um, having influence on the body and the system. General research and Gastrointestinal effects obtained from in vitro studies, human research and animal testing for licorice are the following. It is seen that it selectively inhibits live oxygenase, therefore it is said to be antiphlogistic. It has anti-ulcer activity. This counts for all parts of the gastrointestinal tract, so it's active against gastric ulcers, small intestine and large intestine ulcers. It accelerates mucine excretion and normalizes mucin composition, which means that it makes the mucin more effluent. And the effect that has been seen from this quality is that it prolongs the lifespan of gastric epithelial cells. In patients with chronic duodenal or peptic ulcers, its effectiveness was comparable to antacidic or simitidine treatment, and it showed a reduction of experimentally induced colonic ulcer damage in mice. In combination with other herbs, licorice was effective for dyspepsia, acid reflux, epigastric pain, cramping, nausea and vomiting when compared with placebo and it increases the effectiveness of standard antibiotic treatment against helicobacter pylori and helicobacter pylori is the bacterium that is made responsible for the formation of gastric ulcers in people but latest research showed that it's might also play a role in gastric ulcer formation in horses as well. And in patients with constipation predominant irritable bowel syndrome, licorice with in combination with other herbs improved stool consistency, bowel movement frequency, abdominal pain, bloating, straining and global severity of the disease. So what we see is that it does not only help with the um, mucosa, it's also a very efficient painkiller in this, these patients or showed to be an efficient painkiller and also improved function of the gastrointestinal system. When we are talking about licorice, we need to talk about one other important effect it has. It reduces the conversion of cortisol to inactive cortisone in the body. So cortisol is a, a substance that naturally occurs in the body. And it has the same effect as aldosterone on the kidney. So it leads to water and sodium retention and increased potassium excretion. So when you give it long term or in high doses, it may induce edema, hypertension, so high blood pressure and a lack of um, potassium. So hypokalemia is the term we use for it. And patients with pre-existing hypertension, heart disease, kidney disease, or a high salt intake are more sensitive to these effects. So if one would use, like to use it at all in those patients, it has to be dosed very carefully um, and the renal function has to be monitored. And in the United States, there's only 
deglycerazinated licorice on the market, even for sweet production, not only in for medicinal um, purposes. Licorice can be used either solely or in combination. And its main indication in the gastrointestinal tract are gastric, duodenal and colonic ulcers. And due to the fact we already mentioned that it has an influence on the mucin secretion and consistence, it's also used for bronchitis with phlegm. It's contraindicated in pregnancy in patients with hypertension, cholestatic disorders, liver cirrhosis, and chronic renal insufficiency. And it should not be used long term in patients who get diuretics and cardiac glycosides concomitantly. That said, some authors do not mention any contraindications in animals like Brandic Worm and Melzig in their phytotherapy book from 2018. So dosages for licorice, according to the literature, are 40 to 120 milligram per kilogram of the dried herb, optimally divided into three portions for dogs, or 0.1 to 2 grams daily also for the dog. And in horses, it would be 10 to 60 grams daily of the dried herb. The next herb I'd like to talk to you about is yarrow, in Latin Achillea myrfolium. And we will see in the next slides that it's a very versatile herb as far as gastrointestinal disorders are concerned. Yarrow belongs to the family of Aceraceae. It is also known as bloodwort. It's native to the Northern Hemisphere and the applicable part are the herb and the flower. And we can use powder, decoction, infusion, what means tea, also the fresh juice. Active constituents are essential oils, sesquiterpenes, flavonoids, alkaloids and tannins. And its clinical actions are anti-inflammatory, anti-ulcer, antibacterial, antispasmodic, antioxidant, and choleratic. Yero has shown some very interesting effects in the research that has been done on it. It regulates pro as well as anti-inflammatory cytokines, so it has a modulating effect on inflammation. It showed a positive effect on ulcerative colitis in mice. We will have a look at this later on. And also showed healing properties towards experimentally induced gastric ulcers in rats, and we will also have a look at that paper later in this presentation. It showed a protective effect on the mucosa and the mucin glands, and it showed that it inhibited infiltration of inflammatory cells in the gut wall. Also, prokinetic as well as antispasmodic effects were observed in vitro and in vivo. And this is very interesting because in intestinal diseases in animals, we often see the problem that the gut movement is not going in the right direction. So the ingesta is not transported downwards to the exit of the animal, but especially in the small intestine, we can observe a pendulous movement in this cases. So the ingesta is moved backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards again, which of course um, is a very um, dangerous thing because when it stays in the small intestine for 
too long, then um, bacterial overgrowth can occur. So we have a disbalance of the bacteria in the small intestine then. And Yarrow can actually regulate this. So that's very helpful in those patients that are suffering from chronic um, intestinal diseases. So this is a study of Yarrow in experimentally induced ulcerative colitis in mice. It's a really interesting paper. I would have liked to show you the pictures, but we cannot do that for copyright reasons. So, um, but the paper is free, so you can just um, put the reference into your search machine and then you will get to the paper and can have a look at the pictures, which is very interesting. So, Yarrow significantly reduced the disease activity score in the group treated with oil compared to the non-treatment group. And the disease activity score included loss of body weight, soft stools or diarrhea in addition to bleeding. Also, the yarrow oil showed a lesser reduction of colon length compared to the non-treatment group. And the researchers recognized a lesser alteration of colon morphology in the group treated with yarrow oil com compared to the non-treatment group. Particularly, the treated group showed lesser inflammation signs like swelling, redness, and bleeding. And also the morphology um, or the histology like um, lesser deformation of crypts and lesser inflammatory cell migration was shown in the treated group. Also, the depth of mucosal lesions was lesser in the treatment group. This second study was conducted in rats with experimentally induced gastric ulcers and it has comparable results to the one we talked about before. Also, this is a free paper, so you can put the source information into your search engine and will have access to the paper and the very impressive pictures. The treatment group showed significant reduction of gastric ulcer activity, also reduction of redness, edema, and swelling of the gastric mucosa, and reduction of linear and focal hemorrhaging of the gastric lining. Yero can be used solely or in combination. Indications are gastrointestinal ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, loss of appetite, dyspepsia, cramp colics, and cholehepatic disorders. Yarrow is generally safe to use, but contraindicated in pregnancy as it has a um, motility effect on the smooth musculature. The dosages for Yarrow that are recommended according to the literature is 60 milligrams per kilogram of the dried herb for dogs per day, optimally divided into three portions, or 0.5 to 2 grams daily, and for horses, 10 to 25 grams of the dried herb daily. So the last herb I want to talk to you about today is marshmallow root and its Latin name is Altaea officinalis and again it's an herb native um, to Europe. Like common mallow, Altaea officinalis belongs to the family of Malvaceae. It's a perennial herb and it's native to Europe and Asia, but in between 
cultivated worldwide. Medicinally used are the roots of the two-year-old plants, and they can be used either peeled or unpeeled, what does not make a difference for the um, clinical action. And usually it's used as a powder or cut or shredded. It is said that it's best to be used as a in cold infusion, as heat might destroy the polysaccharides, which are responsible for the clinical effect. There's one study from the University of Vienna. They compared cold infusion with decoction and found no difference in the um, healing effect. But they said that decoction would be preferable due to the better um, antibacterial effect. Of course, heating destroys the bac um, bacteria, and so it's safer if one has concerns um, because of um, microbial um, contamination. The active constituents of marshmallow root are polysaccharides, so they build the mucilage that um, provides the clinical action. Also, it contains flavonoids and pectin, and the mucilage content is highest when harvested in late autumn. The clinical actions of marshmallow are demulcent, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and antibacterial. Results of a small number of studies showed that the anti-inflammatory effects of marshmallow root were comparable to those of steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen. It showed a dose-dependent protection against gastrointestinal ulceration. The mucilage forms a so-called bioadhesive layer that forms a protective layer on the gut mucosa and is quite really adhesive, so hard to wash away. It showed that Marshmallow root can increase epithelial cell viability, proliferation, regeneration, and vitality significantly. And this is attributed to the fact that the polysaccharides are incorporated into the epithelial cell and um, increase their metabolism and protect them against um, cell death. In human studies, marshmallow root significantly inhibits the enzyme that degrades hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is known to be have antibacterial effects and also influences cell metabolism and viability. It also has anti-inflammatory capacities and an influence on the regeneration of cells. Marshmallow root also showed antibacterial effects on Escherichia coli and certain streptococcus chains and protection against experimentally induced gastric ulcers in rats. Marshmallow root can be used solely or in combination. Its main indications are gastritis and gastric ulceration, as well as enteritis and colitis, either with diarrhea and bleeding or constipation with dryness. And in human beings, it's also often used for irritation of the oral and pharyngeal mucosa. And of course, in um, people and animals that suffer from um, cough.
Marshmallow root is generally very safe to use, but it might inhibit absorption of other medications, either herbal or conventional medications. So one, one should um, take this into account when giving it. So the other medication should be given like um, at least half an hour before the marshmallow root is given. Dosages for marshmallow root, according to the literature, are 25 to 300 milligrams per kilogram of the dried herb powdered for dogs. This is the daily dose and it should be divided into three portions. Another suggestion is 5 to 10 grams per day per dog. And there's also recommendation for the tincture which is solved in 25 to 30% ethanol and the concentration of 1 to 2 to 1 to 3, given in a dosage of 0.5 to 1.5 mils per 10 kilogram body weight per day, optimally divided into three portions. Horses really like to take the dried herb when it's shredded. You do not even have to mix it with something else. Or something tasty and the recommendation for the daily dose is 50 to 100 grams. Summarizing one can say that we have several herbs available from different plant families with different modes of action and to throw in some key points here Turmeric has pleiotropic anti-inflammatory actions and increases gut motility. Frankincense inhibits leukotriene formation and decreases gut motility, as well as stabilizes the intestinal barrier. Licorice also inhibits the production of leukotrienes, harmonizes herbal recipes and makes them more palatable but has an influence on kidneys and heart function, especially when given long-term or in high doses. Yarrow promotes cell survival, has antispasmodic and motility regulating actions, and marshmallow root builds a bioadhesive mucilage on the gastrointestinal membranes and inhibits the enzyme that breaks up hyaluronic acid. Although we are still missing clinical trials in animals specifically, the scientific and clinical evidence available so far is promising. On the next pages, I wrote down the references I used for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay safe and healthy. I wish you well. Bye bye.